even if half of it's not really that good, just create content. Um, the thing that stops most people writing a book, I think, is that they never just sit down and write a book. You know, they talk about it and plan it and go to courses and stuff. You know, you just got to do it. Like, sit down and write a book. And it, that's the thing that actually stops a lot of people. I'm your host, Brian McCann, and this is the Road to Wine Expert Podcast. My guest today, Richard Hemming, is a fantastic wine writer. He's also a pretty fantastic wine musician. And if you're wondering what exactly a wine musician is, you'll have to go down the Richard Hemming rabbit hole and listen to Richard's wine grape variety song. He wrote it while studying for the MW, and it clearly paid off. Richard is now a master of wine. He writes for Jancis Robinson. And if you enjoy his sensibility, charm, and humor like I do, you should definitely follow his personal blog as well. Simply put, a great person, a great story, a great time. I really hope you enjoy my conversation with Richard. The simple answer is, is quite... Um, prosaic. I took a job with a wine retailer called Majestic when I graduated from university. I did an English degree and um, had no career plans. So I took a job in a wine shop because I figured it sounded interesting and I had no prior knowledge of wine whatsoever. Stayed with them for six years and um, they're very good. They gave you the training of the WSET courses. So I took my diploma with them. And I got as far as I wanted to. And then in 2007, uh, I basically, I, I, at the time I, I wasn't married, I had no mortgage, I had no responsibilities basically. So I took the opportunity to go traveling. I went to Australia and I worked in a wine shop there and then I did vintage. And while I was doing vintage, I started writing a diary of my experiences which I sent to Jancis pretty much out of the blue. Well, in fact, totally out of the blue. I'd never met her. I didn't know her at all. She didn't know who I was. But she published them, and it, it went on from there. And I started the MW program in 2009, um, having written for Jancis already for a couple of years almost. Um, and that took me a long time to complete. But throughout that whole period, my writing career was starting to develop and I was able to get some other work doing seminars and hosting dinners and that sort of thing. So it all happened gradually and without any kind of plan. <laughs> so, like a lot of the best things in life, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people in the wine trade use the word serendipity to describe how they got where they are. And you know, it's, it's true for me. I, if I had written down that, plan as a plan it would have sounded ridiculous and I don't know how you would enforce it you know it would it, it, I think it has to happen organically to a certain extent sure can you talk a little bit more about you know your decision to send the articles into Jancis like what what inspired that I had been writing for my own purposes for probably a couple of years and I didn't have a blog and I didn't ever submit any articles to newspapers or magazines or anything but I did submit to a competition called the Young Wine Writer Award and that was an annual competition and the first time I entered I got shortlisted um, but I didn't win and the second time this is this is now when I'm in Australia I, I entered again and got shortlisted again and didn't win again and it was because I had come so close and I was a bit frustrated at having not won because the prize was, uh, I mean, it was a, a small amount of money, but it was also an opportunity to write some more sure. articles and to get them published. So I, I, I sent the article, the losing article, to three people who I just really liked and who I thought were, you know, they might be able to give me some kind of feedback. I have no idea what I was thinking really, but they were uh, Jamie Good, Tom Canavan, and Jancis, and I didn't know any of those three. And I, you know, I've got to know them now really quite well. Um, 
I, I beg your pardon, it wasn't Jamie, it was Tim, it was Tim Atkin. Um, anyway, so I sent those three people my article and um, Jancis wrote back and said, it's a good article, I can't do anything with it, but why don't you tell me about doing vintage? And so actually that's how it started. Oh, wow, that's pretty incredible. You could potentially never hear from those people, right? Exactly, yeah. And um, obviously I, I owe an awful lot to Jancis, but I would also say that you, you make your own opportunities, you know, and I, I was lucky at the time because I was able to uh, live for a few years on very, very little income and develop my career and, you know, build up contacts because it really does take time. And one of the things that I'm slightly surprised about, I, 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 you know, I see on Twitter and on blogs, wine writers who are emerging and want to become successful. Um, but they, they rarely seem to get in touch with people and, you know, kind of try and make that connection. Um, I think perhaps they think being online is enough to kind of get noticed and, and sure it, it can be, and it certainly was for some people, but I think that was probably the first generation of web uh, you know, wine into websites, uh, and now it's much, 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 much harder to do that. And so, you know, very, occasionally people come to me and say, "Can I talk to them?" And I'm like, "Yes, I'd love to." You know, because that's if I can help, then great. I think the more of us, the better. Um, but I, I wonder if if some people, you know, feel like that that isn't an avenue that's open to them. But unless you give it a try, you know, you would never know. One of the things I think the wine trade is very good at is being collegiate and open-minded and willing to help. And I am sure that's thanks to, you know, wine itself being something that you share and that encourages people to be social and friendly and so on. So, you know, I think that's a really great advantage of our industry. Um, so I, I'm always happy when I see that being exploited yeah um so let's get back into your talents you know you've got music you're clearly a great writer you, you know a lot about wine as a master of wine you know what with all those talents how did you decide to focus on wine you know i, I never had one of those uh light bulb moments i i, I kind of wish i had because, <laughs> uh it, it's, it makes it an easier story apart from anything else but the truth of it was that by the time I'd stayed at Majestic Wine for six years and I was, you know, looking at my 30s, it, it, I didn't really, ha I didn't want to really train. And obviously I was interested in the product. Um, but it wasn't like, oh my God, I've found my absolute passion right now. I must do this. I was very happy to do it and I was really enjoying doing it. But I just figured I'll, I'll, I'll keep on doing this for as long as I can and see what happens. That was pretty much all it was. So that's how I ended up staying with wine. Um, I mean, I, I, I never, you mentioned music and I love music. I love playing music and listening to music. Um, that was never supposed to be part of the plan. I mean, that was always a hobby for me. It still is a hobby. And I've managed to use music in my work a couple of times, but it's always really only been for sort of lighthearted entertainment purposes. I'm certainly not planning on like writing some kind of magnum opus to, <laughs> try and explain the world of wine or anything. Um, and, and actually, a lot of the culture of wine and music can be quite po-faced. Um, I, I really like the way Neil Martin writes about it because it's very down to earth and very broad in terms of his tastes. But I've read an awful lot of stuff which is uh, pretentious as well. So if I can help make the music and wine connection fun, then that's cool. But that's all it's ever gonna be. So there won't be a grape variety song part two? I don't know, man. I mean, like I could try and, <laughs> try and figure, you see I'm playing La La Land at the moment. That's great. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I mean, I, if I came up with a good idea, I would do it. You know, actually that great variety song, I did two more 
equivalent songs afterwards. I did one which was that entire 1855 classification. And then what was this? Another one I think was all the, what was it? It was all the Appalachians somewhere. The trouble is that they just, they were like lame imitations of the first version. And um, so I kind of decided that I would not do it again unless I came up with a really good idea. And so for the moment, it's not happening now. You touched on your career and, and your trajectory and, and then how the writing, uh, but you've held a lot of jobs, you know, in the industry from working in a warehouse, sellers, vineyards, whole thing. And now you're, you know, digital. So you're doing a lot of content, podcasting, writing. Uh, do you have a favorite wine yeah. job? My current position, you know, as a, a freelancer with a, uh, a connection to Jancis, you know, I write for her regularly. <laughs> And I spend roughly half my working time for her site. And then being able to do lots of other stuff. I mean, that's, you, that's pretty much the ideal scenario. Um, and so I am incredibly grateful. I really loved working in retail. Um, in the end, I had to stop because I couldn't face being nice to customers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, it, I, you know, it, I've just done it too long. Um, I, I've got to say that I hated working in a winery. Uh, it was probably the most valuable experience in terms of learning, but I really hated it. Um, and, and I almost actually would like to try it again just to see if I had a particularly bad experience or if I'm always going to hate it. Um, and I loved working in a vineyard, but I'm not a, um, it's a very physical job um, and I'm not that guy. So, you know, I, while I really, I, I, I did a whole year, just one day a week, but a whole year in an English vineyard. So it was everything from pruning to harvesting. Um, and again, great learning experience. And I did enjoy that because it was a beautiful part of uh, Kent and I got to, you know, be outside and, and learn so much more about, viticulture by observing every week how the vines changed and you could ever learn from a book uh, and I think something I tell to people sometimes if they ever ask is uh, try and get experience in every sector of the wine industry um, because there is no substitute for uh, hands-on learning. Do you think the um, and not besides the hard labor but do you think the the aspect of like working, you know, in a vineyard um, is just because the lack of maybe creativity because you're a very creative person. Do you think that maybe was one of the things that you didn't have an opportunity to sort of maybe. express? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, it was repetitive and boring. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I would find that frustrating and also I have never harbored a desire to make wine. So I don't have that, uh, that urge to see it through and then be able to, you know, give someone a bottle and say, this is my wine. And, you know, remember all the stuff about what the vintage was like and how I pruned this row of vines differently to try something out. So without that, that feeling of, of wanting to do that. No, I mean, I, it was a good learning experience, but I don't then want to do it anymore. No. And, and you're right. Uh, it wouldn't scratch the creative itch either. So let's jump into sort of the, like the, the nitty gritty of becoming a master of wine. Um, who are people I always, you know, it's like, Oh, who would you recommend doing this? I like to do the opposite and ask like, who would you say this is totally not for you kind of going down this path? And, too few people ask that question because there's a really simple answer, which is nobody should do it unless they personally really, really want to be doing it. It doesn't matter what their background is or their age or their level of knowledge. If people don't have a personal motivation to do it, I believe that they can't pass because you have to be so committed. So I would say that it is literally possible for anybody to do it. Um, I mean, there are certain provisos in that now you have to be a, a, a working member of the trade and that wasn't true until 
until recently, but you know, assuming you fulfill the criteria, I would really encourage everyone who feels like they want to do it to go right ahead and do it. And it's for sure not easy, but if you have that personal motivation, you'll see it through. And I don't care how smart or experienced you are, if you don't really care, then you probably won't see it through. And I have encountered some people who they're doing it because their company is paying or they're doing it because they got a bit bored, you know, and these guys are not enjoying this and that they're not graduating. They're not seeing it through. And that's a shame. It's a waste of time and money for everyone. In that regard, and maybe not just master of wine as the, you know that achievement or master sommelier, but just sort of this term like wine expert, right? Which uh, you know, I should probably put in quotes more often, um, and maybe I even will when the summit launches, uh, just because it's it's such a loaded a loaded term. But what do you see for people who like want to achieve some status in the wine industry or be looked at as an expert or just feel themselves like they're an expert? What's the biggest hurdle you think those novices face early on? I think the hardest thing to come to terms with, and also the one thing you really cannot do anything about, is the fact that so much of wine expertise relies on experience. And to quite a large extent, you can only get experience with every new vintage, you know, so it just takes time. I mean, of course, if you're if you have the resources and the opportunity, you can go and taste hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of burgundies, for example, but realistically, most of us don't have that opportunity. And so the only way to develop your expertise and, and have a reputation is with time. Um, and I remember finding that very frustrating when I was starting out because my attitude was like, yeah, but I'm young. So surely that trumps experience, right? Look at all these old guys, they know everything. And they're, you know, but they're old. People want to hear from someone like me. I'm not so sure that's true. I think people really value experience above everything. And, you know, that is especially true for wine. So my advice would be have patience. You really have to be in it for the long haul. And it's, especially if you're trying to look at the writing world, it's not going to pay out for quite some time um but i don't really see how you can speed that up if you were starting over again from the complete beginning what would you do differently if anything um it's a difficult question to answer because without having a plan you know it's difficult to kind of go back and see you know, what you would have changed. I, I tell you, the, the one thing that I wish I did have the experience of, and I'm not, it's not necessarily too late, but I never worked in the service sector. So I've never had the experience of just even, you know, pouring wine professionally for a table, let alone kind of getting to know a wine list and having to recommend things to match with various different courses and all of that stuff. Um, and it's a skill I find fascinating. And when you get great service, I, you know, I, I, it really can make the difference between a good meal and the best meal. Um, and I would love to, to know how to do that. So perhaps the one thing I would change is, I don't know, like a year working on the floor in some restaurant or wine bar. Um, but other than that, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything, but that's only because it all kind of worked itself out. And again, I think that's, to go back to this point, I think to a certain extent that's to do with giving yourself enough time and hoping, you, you know, that trying to take whatever opportunities come your way. Sound advice. Um, I'm sad, though, that we won't see... Richard's piano and wine bar opening anytime yeah, soon. Yeah, well, I don't know. Um, I, the idea of opening a wine bar is is so opposite to my. <laughs> um, I love the idea of it. You know, I love the idea of having your own place. And obviously, I go to a lot of wine bars, and my favorite ones. I, you know, I love the atmosphere, and I I really 
you think, oh, yeah, this would be great. This would be a really fulfilling thing to do. But no, it's not for me. So if someone wanted to do exactly what you do, what path would you recommend them taking? Well, I mean, what works for me is entering as many competitions as possible. Um, I never had a blog until a couple of years ago. And so um, I can't speak about how useful that can be in order of, in, in terms of getting your name out there. Um, I suspect that because the web is so saturated with wine blogs that just starting another wine blog isn't going to be enough by itself, but definitely enter competitions. Um, the more you practice, I mean, this is a, a really well-known point, but it stands to reason. The more you practice, the better you're going to get. Um, and I remember early on when I was writing, I would take forever to craft what I thought was the perfect 500 words. And I, you know, would go back and over and over and over probably was making it worse actually because it was being more and more sort of um, uh, reconstructed. And actually I think it's better to just write prolifically, even if half of it's not really that good, just create content. Um, the thing that stops most people writing a book, I think, is that they never just sit down and write a book. You know, they talk about it and plan it and go to courses and stuff. You know, you just got to do it. Like sit down and write a book. And it, that's the thing that actually stops a lot of people. So I would, you've got to back yourself, of course. Um, and definitely because at the beginning, there are very few other people who are going to, you know, to throw you any work you know you've got to, it takes time to build that stuff up um but but you know i think there it's very hard to prescribe the way to get to a position like mine if you talk to half a dozen other people as i'm sure you will um they're going to tell you different things um i think to repeat like back yourself, give yourself the time um, and practice is the best advice I can give. It's sound advice. It may not be original or uh, groundbreaking, but it's, it's good to hear. Um, I think multiple times and maybe it will get through our thicker skulls. Sure. Um, if someone came up to you and, and asked like, Richard, I, I really want to learn a lot about wine. I'm excited about wine. Uh, what should I do? Where should I go? What should I read? What resources, books, or movies, um, YouTube, blogs, who do you point people to? The books that made the biggest difference to me when I was starting out, well, actually, it was really just one, which was The World Atlas. Because, because geography and wine are so closely connected, um, that book was indispensable for me to start figuring stuff out. And I also think that it's got all of the fundamentals that you need in there. So it's not just the standard reference book for the geography of Appalachians and producers, but it's also actually a really, really good introduction. You know, like there's two or three pages on history, two or three pages on vinification and viticulture. You don't need any more than that to give you the grounding. And from there, I think you can spin off into whatever you might find interesting. Um, but that was the book that did it for me. That, that was the one that made all the difference. Um, and since then, you know, I've read plenty of other books that have been important, but that one was the real fundamental start. It's, it's funny you mentioned that. And I, I really liked your perspective on it because usually I point uh, people to books that are like a little more approachable just because the world Atlas is so dense, but it, to your point, it's sort of like throwing people in the deep end of the pool. If you don't, oh. if you don't like that book, or if you don't find at least some parts of it fascinating, you know, it's probably not for you to like get into this, you know, wine expert path, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's also and and also because I, it, you're right that it is a big, very detailed book, but the writing I think is very very accessible, um, and. So it, I think anybody could get into it, regardless of their level of knowledge, and find it useful. And so, yes, if if people tried that book and, and didn't 
find it useful and, and interesting, then perhaps wine is not the way to go for them. Sure. Um, that's great. Um, who was the most influential person in your wine career? Well, I mean, literally influential was Jancis because she gave me the, the first, my first publication and was then incredibly supportive when I came back to London and started writing and pitching her ideas. And um, that has opened every door since, really. So there is a very literal sense in which she has been influential. Um, there are certainly other wine people who have had a big um, effect. So um, the writers that I really like, which is Tim Atkin and Jamie Good, um, I mentioned Neil Martin earlier. Um, there are many others. Um, and I, I guess seeing their work made me want to emulate their success and, you know, have certainly given me loads of ideas and shown me loads of different styles of writing. Um, I would probably have to mention the, uh, the winemaker, I'm not going to name him, but the winemaker at the winery I worked, who was the reason why I had such a bad time. I hated that guy. Um, <laughs> he was just a really bad people person and he had a really short temper and he made everyone's lives hell. And uh, I really resented the fact that he spoiled that experience for me. So uh, that was influential for sure. <laughs> um, because I was like, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm even more determined now to go and, and do something. And cause I've, I feel like I've kind of been through this intense negative experience. I'm going to take it and, you know, make something out of it. So inadvertently, you know, I can, I can thank him now. <laughs> uh, I know all too often we, you know, I think it's you know, positive people focus on like the positive experiences in their life but those negative ones can certainly like deter you from doing something um yeah i had a terrible experience i remember i was in fifth grade and we had a opportunity to go work like a real day of work you know as a you know, 10 year old or whatever you are in the fifth grade um, and i worked at an ice cream store like everyone's dream as a fifth grader right like oh my gosh and i remember all i did was clean <clears throat> Like I cleaned the bathroom, I cleaned out like the freezer, I like mopped, and th there was no ice cream involved in my day. And I was like, this is the worst. And I said in my mind, you know, here I'd set my mind at 10 years old, I'm like, I am never gonna work in retail. It's a terrible experience. And now yeah. I, I work in a wine shop and I love it. I love dealing with the customers, I love building displays. You know, I don't mind lugging around uh, a bunch of cases of wine. I think there's something satisfying when you stack a bunch of them in the warehouse or even do I'm things sure, like yeah. that. Um, so there's that physical aspect of the labor that I like, but it's just amazing. You, you know, for so long, I probably would have never done it, but if it wasn't for just my passion for wine and my lack of total experience in the industry that a retail job was about the only thing accessible to me, um, at the time I was sort of forced into it, but, um, yeah. I, and again, I would say, you know, to your point too, earlier, you mentioned how you would go back and try it again because maybe it would be a different experience this time. Yeah. Yeah. And actually something when people ask for my advice on where to start, then there are basically two options and those, those are retail and service. And I don't, I, you know, I, I really don't think that there is any better way to start in the industry than one of those two things, because they're, they are, their hard work, their physical work, they're <clears throat> pretty badly paid, generally speaking. Um, but you get 10 hours or more of contact with wine a day and you're seeing how normal people interact with it and it's just an invaluable experience as a, as a foundation. Um, and I think you need that if you're going to progress, if it's kind of unrealistic to think, well, I'm going to, you know, apply for a job as a buyer, or a, uh, you know, a, a supermarket or whatever. And that's never going to happen. And you have to work your way up to it. 
What have you been enjoying lately? Wine, beer, spirits, anything? Gin is on my radar from a purely personal point of view. I have no professional interest and I've, you know, every time I buy a bottle of gin, I try and buy something different and I just enjoy the different flavors. I never try and find out what's in it or anything like that. Um, and there's one called Heppel Gin, which we've been enjoying recently. It's from Northumberland, which is where my wife is from. So, you know, like just that little personal connection is enough for me, you know, like I like to keep things simple and, and it's delicious. Um, for beers, there's a local brewery near me uh, called The Big Smoke, which I think are great. There are so many small breweries around London now, I mean, around the whole country. Um, and the quality is really, really high. So again, having a personal connection, um, just because it happens to be within walking distance, you know, and, and I can go down to, there's a brewery out the back of a, a pub. So you can go down there and you have this really fresh beer every time. So I love that. And for wine, um, there's a particular syrup um, called Solis, which is made by Iona in South Africa, um, which I bought just because I saw it in the shop and I kind of like the label, you know, like, I mean, and I, I know that I like Syrah from Cool Climates, um, but that really, really, really impressed me. I had a friend over and we got through, you know, between four of us, we got through a, a good amount of wine um, and they were all like, yeah, you know, this is okay. It's not really hitting the spot. And this one just blew everyone away. It was extraordinary and it's 25 pounds retail which i don't think is expensive really for what you're getting so that was something that i was really really enthused about yeah oh exciting that's good i like to know about good syrah i'm always that's my heartbreak grape that's one yeah. that when i have it when it's wonderful it's you know the absolute top and then yeah, for me other too. It's for just, me too and much more so than than pinot noir and and that's not to try and this Pinot at all and you know everybody has their own thing but it's always been Syrah that has excited me the most when I've had great examples. Completely agree. I want to be respectful of your time and your day because you got to get outside with the birds chirping and everything <laughs> else. It's uh, people who watch this are probably going to think you live in the most beautiful wonderful place in the world. Yeah um, I just have a speaker right here. With the <laughs> That's all it is. <laughs> this tranquil English garden where the birds are animated and, and chirping. So my last question is, how can people get in touch with you uh, and learn more about you? So I'm on uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And, uh, and I have a website, which is richardhemmingmw.com. Somebody got richardhemming.com and they're just sitting on it. And <laughs> I'm not going to pay for the privilege. So richardhemmingmw.com. And then my most recent project is a podcast, which is called A Glass With, and that's at aglasswith.com, uh, in which uh, a friend of mine called Ollie, who is a big wine personality over here, interviews personalities, celebrities about their love of wine. So series one, we had uh, Pink, um, Sam Neill, we had a cricketer called Stuart Broad who plays for England. So, you know, we're getting some pretty exciting names and, and it's a really casual format that, that's been going really well. So I would encourage people to check that out. If you're a fan of Richard's interview, I encourage you to go to his website and check out his latest dispatches, which are coming from Singapore since he's recently moved. Also, be sure to share this episode with someone you know who will love it. It'll help us get to 1,000 downloads faster. When we get there, I'm going to give away a bunch of books and resources that total up to $1,000 as a thank you for all of the listeners who have jumped onto this podcast early and to help you level up your wine game. Because I know when I was just starting out, building the library and assets, gosh, it seemed like a huge investment. So I'd love to help jumpstart someone's wine learning. So help get us to that 1,000 threshold. And then I will post complete giveaway details on social and on the website. If you want to hear more about the musicians whose songs are featured in this podcast, go to roadtowineexpert.com slash music and learn about these amazing artists who share their work through the Creative Commons license. And make podcasts like the Road to Wine Expert sound pretty good. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. And finally... 
Follow us on Instagram. That's at Road to Wine Expert. And then be sure to email me your thoughts, criticisms, concerns. I'm all ears. I'm Brian, B R I A N, at Road to Wine Expert.com. This has been another episode of the Road to Wine Expert podcast. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time.